Book one, Bloodkin, by Kathy Ashford. Chapter 18. The last week of November was a rough one for everyone. The, re the weather remained bitter and wet, was chafing at everyone's nerves. I had my first fight with Sella. Well, sort of. I was trying to practice creating a light-proof barrier, having a miserable time of it. A cold virus had swept through the hall, and my stuffy sinuses were impairing my concentration. Sella came in looking for some distraction, and I'm afraid I snapped at her. She had retreated, sniffing loudly, and Charlie gave me a look that plainly said I should go make it up to her. But I simply could not be bothered with female histrionics, and I soon gave up my Hyavan practice and went to bed. She was decidedly cool towards me at class and in the hall the next couple of days, and when I couldn't stand it anymore, I went to apologise. Her annoyance had worn off by then. She welcomed me back with open arms. Luckily... Emma discreetly left us to it, and we spent the, e the rest of the evening on the couch, kissing and touching and making up for lost time. By the weekend, the storm had finally broken, and the Saturday of the girls' shopping trip dawned bright and clear, though frost glittered on every surface. What with my cold and Salah, and I had plenty of readings and Calvin practice to catch up on, and I happily watched them leave the hall to go find Lux. Five hours later, I was reclined on a couch up in the common room, struggling through a treatise on human and neathy genetic traits, when the three girls staggered up the stairs, looking exhausted. Well, how'd it go? Sella laughed a little maniacally. Talgoth was right. Lux is crazy. I need a coffee. Or something stronger, Lalitha muttered. Why? What happened? Lalitha went to beg a bottle of wine from the journeyman in the kitchen, who were just about to begin the evening meal, while Sella and Mantley collapsed onto chairs and told me about their afternoon. They had turned up to Anna's apartment, the penthouse suite on the top floor of the building that housed Fiona's shop, to find Anna in the process of kicking Lux out. It was crazy. They were screaming at each other. It was like nothing I have ever seen. Luckily... Jeets was visiting Fiona at her shop and, hearing the commotion, came to the rescue. He told Anna that Lux was going to come and stay with him and his mother in their mansion on the hill, and she would help with chores around the house in return for food and board. Lux was initially reluctant, but after some persuasion, agreed to move in with him. So Jeets took the girls shopping, and then they took one of the steam-powered gondolas up the hill and spent the rest of the afternoon getting Lux settled into her new lodgings. When they finished their glasses of wine, Mantilli and Sello went down to take their baths, meeting Charlie in the common room door. He took one look at their faces and laughed. That bad, was it? Ugh, don't even ask, Sello told him as they left. Lalitha poured another glass for herself, and then once for Charlie and me. Did you find out what you wanted? I asked her, and she looked at me sharply. Actually, no. I didn't get much of a chance. Charlie, did Anna... Did she ever say why we were attacked on Samhain? Lalitha and I never really talked about that night. The horror of the memory had faded slightly, and I no longer woke up choking in cold sweats after nightmares of knives pressing at my throat. Still, it was uncomfortable to bring it up. Charlie shook his head. If she knows, she isn't saying. She doesn't usually participate in a contract, if that's what it was. But she said she had a personal interest in those two men, I prompted. Charlie sighed. She really doesn't tell me much. We sat in silence for a while, considering our wine. <laughs> you really bugged her with that Odette thing the other night. Lalitha broke the silence with her murmured observation. What? How do you mean? Oh, oh, silly Charlie. I thought you knew everything. She was jealous. Couldn't you tell? 
Charlie was almost speechless. What? Why would she be jealous of Odette? Oh, you know. Flaunting the younger model right in front of her. But she doesn't know. Lolita coughed, suddenly embarrassed. Uh, I might have told her some stuff. Hey, I was in shock. What did you tell her? Um, I might have mentioned that you were in love with her. Lolita? A silence then. What did she say? Um, I don't really remember. I, I think I fainted straight after. Oh, sweet little bitch. Charlie groaned and hid his face in his hands. Uh, sorry, Charlie. Hey, at least now she knows. And she didn't seem to mind. You should have hit, you should have seen her on Jessith's birthday. Charlie made a face, remembering. That was... Hmm. I thought she was just being friendly. Was she really jealous? Aletha laughed. You should have seen her face when you introduced Odette. She was furious. With all the excitement that, that followed Lux's rather spectacular arrival, I'd forgotten about Anna's coldness towards the journeyman. Oh, hell. Am I an idiot? Yeah, Lolitha and I chorused, then grinned at each other. Hey, at least she doesn't know you've got a painting of her. You've got a painting of Anna? Where? I grinned at Lolitha. Anna's room. It's an Ashloo. An Ashloo, she squeaked. Oh, can I see? Charlie protested, but Lolita and I grabbed an arm each and towed him towards the door. He muttered furiously the whole way. Bloodkin, interfering in my love life. We don't teach you about that in the enclaves. But Lolita and I could do nothing but giggle as we led him down the stairs. During December, there was palpable excitement on the city, in the air as the city readied itself for the arrival of the royal party. The rains had dissipated, leaving the days clear, but cold and frosty. In the mornings when we walked to the academy, the sun had barely risen, and it was almost dark by the time we made our way home in the evenings. Small groups of staff began arriving in the city from Fortesta to ready the castle for occupation by the Queen and her advisor and the rest of the government. From my room in the hall, I could see them, tiny figures crossing the bridge. After three years of only minimal upkeep, the royal staff had less than a month to restore the castle to a habitable condition, suitable for the elected leader of our country. The Queen was due to arrive just after Yule, on the last day of the year. Out in the streets, the city guards were making their presence felt, even in the quarter, which was wholly unusual. Anna, too, was busier than normal, and the private lounge was off-limits to the rest of us most nights we went down to the Shivering Thistle. Though whatever extra security she was organising, I could only guess at. There were a few incidents that marred the festive atmosphere. A woman's body was found in a back street down in the docks. Her throat slit. Her male companion vanished. It was assumed in the papers that he was the one that had murdered her and had gone into hiding. But the details of the attack were uncomfortably familiar. Then Odette went missing. Ever since Lolita had revealed the reasons for Anna's dislike of the younger woman, Charlie had been polite, friendly even, but had kept her at arm's length. On a free day, she had gone shopping with an old friend of hers from the Enclave, a mingle who had been a student at the academy a few classes ago, who was finishing up her solitary study at the temple. They had been seen together in the quarter, shopping for new, festive robes at Mintardiella's, and had popped into Fiona's to stock up on white. But no matter who the city guards questioned, no one knew where they had gone after that. Min Eve was concerned when Odette didn't return from dinner for dinner that night, but decided that she must have gone to eat and maybe stay the night with her friend. But when she didn't return the next day, Eve went to the guards. Charlie, naturally, was frantic, the days passed and there was still no sign of Odette. 
He went to see Anna at her apartment to beg for her assistance, which had been promised readily, but she didn't seem to hold out much hope. He even took me with him to see Jeets at his home on the hill. In my months in Lil, I had never been up to where the rich and powerful elite of the city made their homes. A small diversion of the Jail River had been dug around the base of the hills, where they rose up from the flat ground that housed most of the city, and this canal fed the steam engines, powered by journeymen, that ran the gondolas. We took a cable car up to one of the levels. Here, narrow streets clung to the side of the hills, providing access to each tier of mansions. Graceful stone bridges arched over the gullies, and we crossed two of these before Charlie led me through a gate and into a courtyard framed by bare winter trees. Jeeps's house was an enormous, was enormous, a great three-leveled mansion with arched windows and stone columns. We knocked on the door, and to my surprise it was Lux who opened it. She had, a, she had bound her hair in a tight bun, and a thick headband swept her fringe off her face. She was wearing a stained old apron over her robe, and we had apparently interrupted her in the middle of the task of polishing the floor. Oh, it's you two. What a pleasant surprise. Though the sharp-toothed grin she gave us was anything but pleasant. Jeets, you got visitors! She yelled over her shoulder and let us follow her inside. Inside was a vast reception area, tiled in gleaming white marble. Jeets's mother had certainly built herself something of an empire from the start the people of Chanyo had given her. Jeets appeared at the top of a grand staircase, wearing a dapper navy blue robe with matching paisley kerchief, his long hair flowing behind him as he walked down to meet us. Lux, is that any way to greet visitors? He growled at her, mock seriously. Honestly, I thought us mingles should stick together, but this one will put me in my grave. I'm sure of it. He was rewarded by tongue, Lux poking out her tongue at him. Off you go, girlie. Go see if mother needs anything. Aye, aye, sir. Lux scuttled away through a door to the side of the stairs. Please, come sit with me in the library. It's much more comfortable. Jeets led us upstairs and down a corridor to his library. The walls were lined with bookcases, each stuffed to maximum capacity with a vast number of books. A fire burned in the grate, and above it hung a large portrait. It was, of, it was of an older woman, picked out in exquisite detail, her hair bright white and her skin creased but tanned. She had a sharp, hawk-like nose and a fierce expression. I noted the signature, Ashlew, of course it has to be, but a commission of this size would have cost so much money it made my head swim. Jeets bade us sit in upright armchairs around a small table, and he poured three glasses of wine from a delicate crystal carafe. Now, by the look on your face, Kyosh, I gather you are not here to talk about the weather, hmm? Charlie nodded and filled Jeets in on the details surrounding Odette's disappearance. So, she was with the Mingle Girl, yes? Yes. Ah. Oh. Ah? Uh? Jeet scratched his head for a second and took, took a sip of his wine. I have heard... rumours. Rumours? Yes. Rumours of young mingles, male and female, going missing unexpectedly. Most have been put down to the flightiness of the young, and mingle youths tend to be willful, he grimaced. And... Due to the nature of our birth, many don't seem to care much about us. This, he said with a trace of bitterness. Oh, it was alright for me. Being first generation, I had to be brought up in an enclave, but second and third generation mingles, those with less than one quarter Neathi blood, can survive childhood outside. I understand that they can suffer some mistreatment in some areas. But shouldn't they be going to the academies? I broke in. Jeets frowned. Well, they should be, but as I said, young mingles can and do refuse to go. It's illegal, of course, but what can you do? So, mingles have been dis disappearing and nobody cares. I was horrified. Jeets shrugged. Pretty much. Now, I'm not sure if there's any link between these disappearances 
and the troubles your Anya has been having, but... What troubles? Charlie was instantly alert. She hasn't told me anything. Hmm. Well, it's a bad business she's in. Very bad indeed. He shook his head in disapproval. Uh, my sources indicate that there is some sort of rival organization. More than willing to take on the contracts she refuses. It appears that this organization is even less in the way of morality and respect for life than Anya. But that's humans for you. They'll do anything for money. No offense, Jasseth. Uh, none taken. So is Anya in danger? Charlie asked desperately. Jets gave him a wry smile. I thought we were here to talk about this Odette girl. Nah, well, no. I'm sure she's not in any personal danger. She's more than capable of looking after herself, but... Yes? Charlie almost yelled at him. Well, uh, those who contracts, whose contracts have been refused by our friend Lamin tend not to be overly pleased about it. And the families of the contracts that the other organization freely accepts, even less so. Do you understand? Perhaps with the Queen's imminent arrival, the increased presence of the city guards will deter some of this activity. But you know how useless the guards are. He gave a mirthless laugh. Or perhaps it will go the other way, and the presence of the royal party will act as some sort of catalyst. But for what? I have no idea. Jeets toyed with his wine glass and sat back in his chair. Now, like I said, I'm not sure yet whether this has anything to do with your missing journeyman. If Mingles are in fact being abducted, rather than just taking off, then the Odette could well be fine. They, if there even is a they, seem to have no interest in full-blooded Nyathi. So, what can we do? asked Charlie bleakly. Jet sighed. I'm afraid, my dear boy, that at this point there is probably nothing you or anyone else could possibly do. Jeets was very, uh, Charlie was very quiet on the gondola ride down the hill, and for days after our visit to Jeets. Everyone in the hall was on edge, the other two journeymen especially, who refused to leave the hall at all. Any excitement we had felt about the arrival of the Queen was dampened by worry. Sala tried to cheer me up, hypothesizing that Odette had just gone travelling, as journeymen were wont to do, but I knew, I just knew that something terrible had happened to her. Three days before Yule, as curiously brownish skies promised the first of the winter snows, a crowd of fishermen pulled Odette's body from the lake. End of chapter 18!